Hello, Prince Street family. Uh, this seems rather weird. You are a virtual congregation right now. I'm picturing all of you sitting here. I know where all of you normally sit. Um, I can almost hear Pat saying amen. And uh, as we come together this way during these um, really unprecedented times, we are going to continue to work and we're going to continue to minister the best we can, but we're going to be wise about it. One of the things we do need is we need you to continue to give. One way uh, that you can give is writing a check and mailing it to the office at 17 North Penn Street. Another way you can give if you're able to get out, you can bring your envelope with a check or money, whatever, however you give, and you can drop it off at the office. We even have an offering plate in the back entrance of the office. You can just drop it in there. You don't have to come in, and then you can leave. But one of the easiest and safest ways to give is on the screen that you see right now. That's our website. That's the home page of our website. And if you click on that media button, that tab at the top, then it will bring up that drop down. And then you want to click on where it says online giving. Pretty easy. And then it will take you to this page. And it gives you a link where you can click on that link and you can safely set up how you want to give. Whether you want to set up automatic, I mean, that's what I, my wife and I personally do. You can set up one-time giving during this time because, frankly, we don't know how long we're going to have to practice kind of that self-quarantine or what are they calling it, social distancing. But this is a real threat, especially to our elderly population and our compromised population. So we want to continue to give, support the ministry, continue to pray that we'll be back together soon. But in the meantime, I just ask that you give. Another way to stay connected is signing up for the Daily Dig. We just need an email from you or if you already have an email on, on record, then let Lee, our ministry assistant, know that you would like to get the Daily Dig. It's a devotional that goes out Monday through Friday, and it reflects, kind of interacts with the sermon. There are some things that you won't hear in the sermon. There's some repeated items, but always maybe from a little bit of a different angle. So I just want to encourage you to stay connected the best you can through our website, through Facebook. Everybody here, especially staff and the board and our, and our commission chairs are working really tirelessly to keep everybody feeling very unified. And I really am thankful for everything they're doing. So as we begin to look at this, I'm going to ask that you bow your heads and we pray together at this time. It says in Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. We will not fear. Look with mercy, O God, our Father, on all those whose increasing years bring them weakness, distress, and even isolation. Provide them homes of dignity and peace. Give them understanding and the willingness to accept help where they need it. And as their strength diminishes, increase their faith and their assurance of your love. Almighty God, you have entrusted us with a great heritage. Provide our leaders with the spirit of wisdom in whom we entrust the authority of our government. And may there be justice and peace here at home. And that through our obedience to your son, we may show forth your praise among the nations. 
In the time of prosperity, fill our hearts with thanksgiving and gratitude. And in the day of trouble, strengthen us to remain faithful to you. Fill your church with all truth, in all truth with peace. Where it's corrupt, purify it. Bring us holiness. Where it is in error, direct it and reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, bring us back together, unified. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Son, in whose name we pray, amen. I want you to turn then to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to continue the Son of David, the Matthew series. This is a very, very timely passage, as last week was as well. But as we look at this, this is one of those great stories about when Jesus walks on the water. It's all anybody ever remembers about their, this story, but there's so much more. So let me set the table. So Jesus tells the disciples after he has ministered to them and to the thousands of people by feeding them, he sends the disciples away. They get all 12, get into a boat, and they head to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus says, go to the other side. Jesus dismisses all the crowds, and after they're all gone, Jesus goes up into the hills to be alone to pray. Finally, he has time to pray. And as he's praying, and it gets late into the night, says the fourth watch, sometime between three and six in the morning, he sees the boat out into the middle of the, the Sea of Galilee, and it's fighting a headwind. And the waves are battering it, and Jesus goes to them. And this is where we're going to look at this story. I call this against the wind, against the wind. Now, you know, I'm a product of the, the 70s, and Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band had a great song and album called Against the Wind. You know, throughout history, the church has faced strong headwinds before and will again until the appearing of Jesus Christ. So when Jesus sent all 12 disciples in one boat to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, it is this wonderful picture of the church on mission. The church on mission. So when we reflect on this passage, verses 23 through 36, I want you to ponder this question. What do we do when getting to the other side isn't so easy? What do we do? So let's follow along as I read this. And then we'll go back and we'll talk about that very question. Remember, this is a great picture of the church on mission. But what do we do when getting to the other side isn't so easy? Well, verse 23, after he, Jesus, had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it, a strong headwind. During the fourth watch, probably between three and six in the morning of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking, on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately, immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Those are words we need to hear. And then you got to love Peter. Lord, if it's you, 
Peter replied. Tell me to come to you on the water. I don't know how long it took Peter to come up with that solution, but it was pretty bold and pretty impetuous, but it was really filled with a lot of faith. And Jesus says to him, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak and all who touched him were healed. We miss all that's going on here because it's so hard to deal with Jesus walking on the water. And then we see Peter doing that before, obviously, he begins to sink. So here is Jesus sending the 12, putting all his eggs in one basket, if you want to put it that way. He sends them across the lake to the other side while he goes up to pray. The future witness, the very apostles who are the foundation of the church are all in one boat going to the other side and are hit with the waves and the wind. So against the wind, that's why we call it this. What do we do when getting to the other side isn't so easy? We'll look at the first couple verses there. We row harder. We work harder. It's easy to overlook the fact that the disciples didn't give up and just turn around and come back. We don't think about that. It has been several hours since they've been gone and they're working against the waves and the wind. It would have been so easy for them just to throw their hands up. Oh, Jesus will understand. He'll, he'll be okay with it. This is crazy. Just turn around. Let's go back. But they don't. We row harder. I'm sure that Peter said something like this. Jesus told us to go to the other side and we're going to do what he said, no matter what. But you know what we miss in this story? Look at verses 22 or 23 and 24. But it says that Jesus went up on a mountainside to pray. Went up to pray. The disciples, the future of the church, the people of God in that boat are wrestling with this wind and waves and Jesus is praying. No doubt, Jesus is praying for them. We have all heard the old saying, don't work harder, work smarter. Well, let me tell you, Sometimes the only option is obedience, and that requires perseverance. But as we're persevering as a church, Jesus is interceding for us, just like he was for those disciples. What do you do when getting to the other side isn't so easy? We persevere, because Jesus is is praying for us. But something really strange happens here. Something else happens. Typically, we tend to cry out, what help? What help? Help? 
In our day and age, it's a figment of your imagination. No one is coming. When I look at this passage and I see in verse 25, during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they said, it's a ghost. It's a ghost. See, Jesus, to me, so many times today, is this shadowy, ghostly figure. ghostly figure there is no help coming no one's coming it's a figment of your imagination it's a ghost Jesus is nowhere to be found I'm sure many churches are wondering today during these days how will we survive these winds and waves see the psalmist in Psalm 73 was complaining and he says to those who are wealthy and rich how would God know does the most high know anything does he even care but the most amazing words that come from Jesus when we are crying out thinking that no one is coming to help it is when we hear the words of Jesus in verse 27. Jesus said to them, take courage. It is I, don't be afraid. See, there is help. Jesus is interceding for us. Jesus is coming alongside us. He is not a figment of our imagination. And yet... There are times when, like Peter, we lose our nerve. This is a great story. Then Peter, you know, he says, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. And Jesus says, come. I love the translation by J.B. Phillips when he says in verse 31 where he says why did you doubt you little faith but J.B. Phillips says Jesus saying this what made you lose your nerve like that what made you lose your nerve Stanley Hauerwas a great scholar he put it this way and this really stuck with me Peter doesn't sink and then becomes frightened. He becomes frightened, then begins to sink. I think that's right. But like Peter, we take our eyes off Jesus. We begin to look at the waves and the wind because we're not fixing our eyes on Jesus. See, that's when you lose your nerve, when you take your eyes off the Lord. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way in Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, those who have gone on before and those who are with us now, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. He says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And here it is, verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured. He persevered the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. See, Peter lost his nerve. He was willing to take that step of faith 
but he took his eyes off Jesus. May we not take our eyes off Jesus at this time. But I love how the story turns because we finally begin to worship. What do we do when getting to the other side isn't so easy? Why does it take so long for the disciples to worship? But thank God they finally do. You see then verse 32 and 33, and when, the, and when they climbed into the boat, Jesus and Peter, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat, the other disciples, they worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. Truly. We finally worship. In the midst of winds and waves, we turn our eyes to the Son of God who has been given, as Matthew will say later, all authority in heaven and on earth. And in that moment of worship, it becomes calm. We have peace. Peace that the world cannot give. Peace that the world does not understand but we finally worship. And in worshiping together with our eyes fixed on the Son of God who has been given all authority in heaven and, and on earth, we worship and we have peace and we have calm. The waves and the wind are calm. Praise God for that. I would challenge all of you right now to fix your eyes on the one who has all authority to worship him. One who has all authority to be truly worthy of worship. But the story doesn't stop there. They make it to the other side. They make it to the side. Jesus told the disciples to go to the other side. He took them to the other side. Now I know Pat just said amen. He took them to the other side. Think about this in this passage. As we go through this and we, like the church through the ages, have faced plenty of headwinds and waves. But he is praying for us. He is coming alongside us. He's in the boat with us. And he will get us to the other side. Amen and amen. Let's bow our heads together and pray. Father, I thank you that you are the God who has sent your son, and Lord Jesus, you said you will never abandon us. You will never forsake us. That you will take us to the other side. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for that so much. And we all said amen. I'd like to close with Psalm 46.10 as our benediction. And right now in your home, whether you're watching this in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, just like to ask you to bow your head as though we're bowing our heads together. And the psalmist says this, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.